Welcome to Body Banter. Uh, my name is Shagun Yedele, and I'm calling you and speaking to you today from Kelowna, which is in the traditional unceded and ancestral territories of the Silks Okanagan Nation. And with me, as usual, is Claudia. Hi, everyone. My name is Claudia Krebs, and I'm joining you from the ancestral, traditional, unceded, and occupied territory of the tsleil Squamish, and Musqueam Nations, also known as Vancouver. Um, we are so thrilled to have two guests on the podcast today, and I'm a little bit starstruck, I have to say. Uh, we have renowned um, British-Canadian author Tessa McWatt here, and her nephew, Sean McWatt, who is an anatomist at Western University. Welcome to both of you. Tessa, if you want to introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Shagan and Claudia. It's a really a privilege to be here. I'm Tessa McWatt, and I'm um, an author, and I'm also a professor of creative writing at the University of East Anglia, and I'm talking to you from London in the UK. Welcome, and Sean. Hi, Shagan and Claudia again. Thank you very much. And this is this is really exciting to be on this podcast with my aunt, especially. Uh, it's it's been a while. We've been talking about these uh, themes, and I'm excited to share with both of you. Um, I'm at Western University. I'm currently teaching laboratory based anatomy to the medicine, dentistry, and PT uh, physical therapy programs. Um, and I will start up with the undergraduate stuff uh, in the winter. Thank you so much, uh, Sean and Tessa. It's a real honor to have you both. And, and I'll start with you, Tessa. Um, and like Claudia, I am incredibly star starstruck <laughs> because um, I, I, I really um, have been reading your book, uh, Shame on Me, uh, The Anatomy and Anatomy of Race and Belonging. And, um, and I really... Um, I'm deeply appreciative of the strategy uh, uh, that you chose to adopt in the book by like, you know, like the name says, an anatomy of race, but it, you literally actually then go and itemize different parts of our anatomy, you know, the skin, the ass. The, can I say that? <laughs> oh, the, yeah, you just <laughs> did. And it's good. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, and 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 those and so on and so forth and so my question is um can you just give us like a a, a brief introduction to that book and what sure. what how did you come about following that strategy in writing the book sure yeah thank you well um i started to think about i think i've been thinking about race in this way since i was very very young because of my mixed race and my very sort of um complex mixed race background i've been trying to understand in the world of black and white how i fit and i think what happened in in 2016 was um here in the uk brexit happened in the us trump happened and i think that for me polarized the the black white question to such an extent that I had to bring my position forward I had to bring sort of who I was into the into the spotlight in order to make that a much more subtle argument um, and so I, I always knew for some reason I always knew that I was going to think about it or look at it in terms of body parts um, and those body parts are the racialized body parts as you say you know the ass the nose the hair the skin those body, those body parts that have actively been um, racialized in throughout history. And I think in terms of the experiment, so the, the book is set up in terms of um, a, a, an experiment. So it's an anatomy, and uh, but also an experiment in, in anatomy in that um, it's got a hypothesis, which is around storytelling. It's got um, a, an experiment and then um, findings and, and sorry, analysis and findings. So it's structured that way. And then the body parts form the chapters. And I was really writing back to race science from the 17th century, you know, be, uh, because it was th those experiments are the things that or those I guess, yes, they were experiments, but those proclamations in terms of, of um, what the human body was um, and what um, people were doing, measuring heads and, um, um, you know, in, around, around measuring heads, but also the categorization, even back to Linnaeus and the categorization of the African body, um, those things were the beginning of 
um, you know, a kind of storytelling around race that I wanted to unpack and I wanted to write against. So uh, my my experiment is a storytelling against um, race science. I love this storytelling aspect of it because um, one of the things that I think about a lot is the stories we tell about human bodies um, and how we embody our bodies that stories are being told about. And I find your book is such a personal journey of embodying your body um, and reckoning with the stories that have been told about you without you. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're taking you're taking the pen and you're saying, no, this is my story to write and I'm going to define my own body. And mm -hmm. that was very, very powerful. And I loved the, like Shagan, I loved, of course, as an anatomist, the chapters named after parts of the, the human body and, and, you know, those racialized parts of the body. Um, so thank you for, oh, yeah. for that. <laughs> Well, one of the things that became clear to me is because, you know, I think because it's race is a construct, because it's a story, and I talk about that, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't telling any story that was not mine. So that's why it had to become very personal. It had to be very, I had to use my body as the experiment, you know, so I, I couldn't, I couldn't, again, make something appear objective the way those race scientists did at the time. So it had to become my journey and my that the dissection dissection of my body um so it ends up being quite personal yeah it is and you've included your family in the book as well talking about your ancestors and your living family including sean um <laughs> sean you make an appearance in the book as a child um in the memory of your aunt um at a some family gathering and celebration you're playing with lego and your aunt asks you what color are you and you say blue because you've got all these colorful lego pieces in front of you tell us do you remember this at all um and yeah tell us about that so i, I don't remember it but it's been a a running uh, theme that's come up in our family a quote that's that's reemerged on several locations throughout my life so i know i i assume i said it uh <laughs> But yeah, I, I don't know. So for me, I, I mean, this book, it was for me a very transformative book as well, because um, as, as Tessa said, she she's using this as a way to dissect her own body, but I had not really given it a ton of, given these ideas of race and my race and where I fit in it much thought um, until really that book, to be honest, because I, you know, I grew up in a very um, mixed race household in a way and my, my mom's Irish and of course my dad's Guyanese and um, my cousins and of all different types and shades and everything it was it was never it was present but never a, an exact topic that I reflected on um, but this book when I read the initial draft of the book it really forced me to to sort of focus on that and where I fit in it um, and so for me yeah, it, it was it was very it was an unpacking that allowed me to then what, what do I do with this information and then that sort of got me into more um, trying to figure out how I integrate that with my career uh, and that led to things like black and anatomy and also the way that I'm, I'm trying to decolonize my teaching and all these sorts of things so. Um, yeah, what we're, well, I don't remember the quote it's kind of a, a, a symbol of just like how ignorant I was to race until these unfortunately these later. Um, stages in my sort of career development almost i think can i just jump in i think it was what's really interesting about that when sean said that he when i asked him what co what um color he was because we were talking about race at the thanksgiving table i think and those conversations are all always really lively and heated in some ways <laughs> and um and i think my, uh, him saying blue to me was so resonant or so important because it it made me think that um, you know it made me it made it clear about how much it's a thing that's taught you know how much race is a thing that's passed along through people through power and for him not to have thought about it was quite refreshing you know that he hadn't been racialized in our family that way um, and that he was allowed to be blue I thought that that was quite beautiful. <laughs> that is so so fascinating and and thank you sean and again tessa for for bringing that up and maybe to move the conversation along you know i, I find that 
it's like a um, kaleidoscope. It's like so, so many themes that one could pursue. But the one that comes following up from what you said, Tessa, is that aspect of race being a construct that is taught. Because I remember like uh, we was talking just before we started recording for the podcast, how I uh, was born in Nigeria and lived my whole, well, for my whole, almost my entire life as an, uh, in Nigeria before moving to South Africa. And, and because South Africa is a completely different environment, you know, race wise, um, just because of the history of apartheid. And I remember my friend and I were discussing one day and he said, you know, I never realized that I was black until I came to South Africa. <laughs> and that really yeah. was so profound to me. I said, it's true that I, you, I, it did not occur to me that the skin color race was not a thing until exactly. it was really front and center in, in, in your face. And, and I'm, and I'm wondering how you react to that. Do you have some thoughts about that? Maybe to develop that aspect that race is something that people tell you you are, not what yes. you tell yourself. Yes, absolutely. And I think there's a, um, the Nigerian author Chimamanda um, Adichie Ngozi um, says that when she felt she understood that she was Black when she moved to the States. Um, and so, you know, I, absolutely, it's something that people, that someone tells you. Um, and it could be that someone in your family tells you, and it could be somewhere, you know, about, you know, the pride of, of, of um, a kind of ethnicity and a racial identification that a family sort of has to build against the, the, the white supremacy of the outside world. So that, so, it, but I do think it is something that children don't naturally see, don't naturally engage in. And, and I think that it is a thing that comes with power and that the, the identifier, the namer, and this is why it's really interesting um, to think about anatomy, I think, in this, in this case, in terms of what people can name and label uh, um, also offers a certain amount of, of power. And so I think that's the other thing I was kind of writing against. And, and you know, race, I always, it, there's a line in the book that race is, um, is like six o'clock. You know, it's, it's, um, it's something that is not real. It's something we agree on as a construct. It's something that, you know, is not real in, you know, time isn't, our clock isn't real, time isn't real, but we all agree that we have to be, um, you know, home at six o'clock or be at work at nine o'clock or whatever it is. So we, so it's real and not real. It has consequences. And I think that's why I like the idea that it's, it's like six o'clock because it, you know, there are consequences in missing your train and there are consequences into in being labeled or in be or in being um, a black young black man in the street in in America, um, you know, it, try, or or trying to drive a car, you know. So so there so there are real things attached, even though so it's not enough to say that race is a construct because that makes it a little bit dismissible. Um, and but but we can't at this point. We haven't yet agreed that um, it's that it's not real. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Tess. I, I sadly agree, right? Like it's stories that we tell. And it's um, from our own experience um, in, in my team in the Hive, um, during the summer of 2020, we were faced with, um, it was maybe the toughest summer that I think most of us have faced from sort of a geopolitical situation where we're in the middle of a pandemic, um, the murder of George Floyd highlighted the racism that we live in. I had people in my team being attacked for being Asian um, in this city here um, because there was this myth that they had brought the virus here. And um, I remember really having a very serious, a very vulnerable team meetings um, with students. Most of my team is students where people were very upset and crying. And we were trying to figure out, well, what does this mean? Here we are, a big team, trying to create anatomy resources, one to address teaching in a global pandemic, um, and to create resources for the world to, to learn with. And we looked at our Zoom call and we had one white male, one white male student, everybody else didn't fit that categorization if you want 
And we looked at what we were drawing and it was predominantly white males. Um, that's what we were creating. And it was, I still remember this gut-wrenching feeling that I had as I looked into my team and I said, we're not even drawing ourselves. Um, we're so stuck in this story that anatomy is the white CrossFit guy, um, that we're not drawing women, we're not drawing uh, queer folks, we're not do uh, drawing racialized folks, we're, we're sticking to the predominant story. And that was, um, was hugely upsetting and it, it led us to really change everything. Um, so it was a huge catalyst. Sean, for you, you are one of the founders of Black and Anatomy, and I know that you and Melissa also lived through that moment in 2020 of, of reckoning, and you took action. And um, tell us more about that journey and your, you know, what that means for you personally. Um, and yeah, go for it. <laughs> Thanks. That, that was a very powerful story of kind of like that, that transition of COVID. And I think a lot of us went through that, um, especially using digital resources and things like that, that are, you know, they take an immense amount of work to create. And unfortunately, they are created with that white male standard. And that's kind of what we're stuck with until, you know, they continue to be created. So I thank you for like acknowledging that. And then with your power at the hive and things like this that you can do to contribute to that, um, those resources, I think the future looks good for that. Um, but back to sort of your question, um, yeah, the Black Anatomy, I guess, essentially started as a tweet from um, Melissa. I didn't know it was Melissa, but a, a Black Anatomy account behind uh, a Twitter profile. Um, and I think it just hit at the at the right moment. Like, I think a lot of people were um, sort of just, again, reeling from George Floyd's murder and, and sort of figuring out, trying to figure out where they fit and what they can do. And for me, especially it hit at this moment where I was sort of starting to acknowledge my my blackness more and and the, the black side of me. Because I, I, again, growing up in a very white um, area uh, I, I and looking very white and passing for white, I never really considered that um, as a part of my true core identity and the, and the, the importance of that piece of my identity and the, how I could politicize it and use it um, to better things. So um, again, with my aunt's book, helping push me in that direction a little bit. And, and then of course, all these, these environmental triggers, like, like George Floyd's murder. Um, it, I saw the tweet at the right time and reached out, um, expecting there to be a lot of people, but it was just me, Melissa Carroll, Allison Nesbitt, and Kristen McPike. Um, and the four of us sort of just built this thing that was, um, it slowly, gaining momentum and and becoming more and more stable as a as something that I think is going to last for a long time and I hope will um but what you talked about in this representation the idea of representation and the words we use the language we use to describe the body and and um and it would describe our own bodies and embody our anatomy uh is stuff is stuff that we're thinking about and trying to encourage like with our decolonization series we're trying to tackle eponyms and all these little things that we're trying to throw out in the world to sort of um push us to see the the non-white in the anatomy um and yeah i i hope it i hope it continues to grow and that we can continue to to build it and in more um impactful ways too like bringing um bringing more underrepresented groups into anatomy and into teaching as well. So. Thanks, Sean. Um, Tessa, in your book, you talk about the shame that you've experienced. Um, and that always is is such a um, troubling thing when somebody feels ashamed of who they are, and their body. Um, and I, I think if I read it correctly, it, it's we've been telling the story of the white male being normal, like normative, that mm -hmm. everybody who doesn't conform with, conform with that is going to be different and um, should aspire to, to whiteness and maleness, quite frankly. Um, and so the shame that we all feel um, navigating spaces where the story is still a white male story, um, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. Yeah, I think it's, I'm glad that you said it's a shame that we all feel because, you know, my, the shame in the book is, is about the shame of possibly, you know, those first, um, 
first people who had to sell, sell their children um, in a, to, to, to slavery in order to survive because crops failed, for example. But it's also my shame in terms of being part of um, uh, a whiteness that, and that is the opposite, you know, that is the, the colonizer and the, and the, the slave um, owner. But I think, you know, if I think about, um, about what, how we still exist in this mode of, you know, white supremacy and in the, on, on the plantation, one of the important metaphors for me is the plantation in the book. And because that's what I'm a product of, you know, I am a product of all the people that were brought either through enslavement or through indenture um, or as owners to, to um, e extract resources from um, a particular um, area. And we are still functioning under that kind of structural inequality. And it's that shame I actually feel more strongly than ever these days. And I think that's the shame we all share and should share, you know, like who, and, and, and one of the things that the book asks is for everyone to sort of account for who they are in that sense, like in that structure, you know, who are you in the face of anti-Black racism and who are you in the face of migrants drowning in the sea in, 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 in uh, the Mediterranean and who are you in the face of genocide of the Indigenous people, you know, it's just this question of shame and, and acknowledging it, but also doing something about it. I think that's the, the for me, the biggest thrust in, in the book and the idea around shame is because shame can be quite debilitating. Shame, shame is a, is something that makes you hide. And I think I'd, I'd, um, I, I want to get all of us away from that. I want us to acknowledge who we are and what we're doing and what kind of systems we've been living under. Um, and in, in order to overthrow those systems and just like you are doing, you know, in terms of anatomy and because those are those are structural and systemic problems that, you know, slowly from the inside, I think it's really great in terms of what you and Sean and, and the others are all doing. Thank you so much, Tessa. And um, yeah, I, I like that aspect of your book in that it's it's almost like a call to action, to individual action um, and to people to, um, to own their own stories and to own their own legacies and their own roles maybe in perhaps perpetuating what, uh, what's, what's been, but then commit to making a difference now. Um, and, you know, um, I want to read this section where you were talking about when people ask you who you are and it's it's brief so that's i'm just going to read it um it, 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 page six i think or maybe not i'm reading from the electronic version so the pages are not perhaps the same so it says i write now to examine what i am physically eyes nose blood hair in relation to what i am as a person to place myself under the microscope to experiment to entangle to untangle myths from skin and bone when people ask me what race I am, I say, writer, black, white, brown, yellow, red. These words I also place under scrutiny. Black is related to a body, but blackness seems something else entirely. White is related to skin's color, but whiteness is a state of mind. Shame is a way of talking about them both in the same breath. The colors themselves are meaningless to define a person. I use them here with invisible scare quotes, always aware that language is glassy and deep like a frozen lake. Language is trickery, language is insufficient and yet ample. Language is powerful and painful. What am I, what are you? I mean, this is, this is a masterpiece. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I, just, I just love that, that, you know, something that is, simple and yet messy something that is kind of apparent that people say duh he's black but yet so complex <laughs> you know it's you know and, and it's you know like the, the language is you know language is trickery you know you really don't you know it, it can be manipulated to achieve some so 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 much good and yet so much evil at the same time and i guess so my question is you know to move back to to where i started you know, the people that one 
would call allies. So for me, I'm at like I would be allies to people who don't have the identity that I have, and other people who might not share my identity will be allies to me. To what extent should we? Um, because I'm looking at that intersectionality where you are you you don't really identify as some some other like some other like some other person might, but yet your stories inter inter you know there's an interrelatedness there's an interaction between your stories and and so I'm I'm, I'm wondering to what extent um we should encourage that and how might we go about wa walking together in, in each other's shoes and, and sharing each other's stories I mm -hmm. hope you understand my question yeah I think I do I mean I think that's where the 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 my identity as a writer comes in because I you know I we we are all storytellers so we're all kind of writers you know we we're, we're storytelling all the time um we are making up this encounter we each have a different you know we have a different uh, experience of this each of us will have a different one and i think what's important is is that um to understand where power lies you know and i think when you when you said um that it's that it's um that it's intersectional that's where we can work together because that power can create creates gender creates creates um or sorry creates sort of gender violence um creates um racial violence creates class violence you know i think and that intersectionality in understanding where the power lies and who is creating those things can help us join up you know we are all the, the issue around identity politics is that it's really important to find your identity that you know in a way that 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 maybe perhaps didn't you maybe in a way you were struggling with identity it's an, important to find that and to um, feel at home and to feel camaraderie with others around a certain identity but you know as identity politics becomes more entrenched and we fight against each other around language and identity. People in power love that. They love that we are are, are fighting with each other, you know, because they the tank they just roll the tanks in or the or the convoys or whatever it is while we are um you know trying to reconcile language and reconcile our own abilities to feel identified in, in a group and to, all we want is belonging, right? And all we want is a way of of freedom, we want freedom ultimately, all of us. Um, but while you know we are um, arguing over language <laughs> because that's what happens, you know the, the freedom convoys <laughs> are rolling in to to the state capital kind of thing. So I think it's important to recognize that what we are all um, working towards or against, um, really, we're working against that kind of oppression. We're working against a kind of um, uh, uh, sort of supremacy that says that one thing is powerful and the other things are not. And so I think that's where we need that intersectionality, that it's all, that we're all on the same side. Thank you, Tessa. That made me tear up. Thank you so much for, for saying that. Um, as you were speaking, I was going back to another aspect that you mentioned in your book, which is the classification of species by Linnaeus. And um, I've talked about Linnaeus before, as I've talked about how there's misconceptions of the brain. You know, we like to categorize everything. The Marie Kondo um, sort of uh, approach to understanding humanity, right? You organize everything and, you know, if it sparks joy, you keep it. And if you don't, you throw it out, right? And that's kind of the approach a lot of people take, categorizing uh, the human experience. And um, and every and when even as I was reading it in the book, all I could see was these little butterflies with the little <laughs> pins through them, you know, beautifully categorized um, according to their morphology, trying to make sense of things. And I do wonder, and and Sean, maybe you can comment on this as an anatomist, as you know, um, a scientist. This is very much what we're brought up in as scientists, right? To categorize to describe by morphology, to divide. Um, so our understanding of the natural world, our understanding of the body is through division. Anatomist, the word itself means to cut apart. And so we are always 
looking at the parts, trying to understand the whole by dividing it and um, creating boundaries. And Tessa, as you just so eloquently said, these boundaries then lead us to fight amongst ourselves because we don't accept those boundaries. We're like, but wait a second, why did I, the blue butterfly, get put into this series? Those guys look more gray to me. I think I should be more with the cerulean ones over there. Um, anyway, Sean, maybe you can comment on that, what this means in your sort of for your training as a scientist, your work as an anatomist and your identity. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a big question, but yeah. I think it comes back to that storytelling as well. And um, one of the one of the examples I can think of just a uh, recent example is something we talked about during Black and Anatomy Week on our Saturday paint night. We all got together. I guess it was not a night. It was noon. But um, we painted a kidney. And part of the reason was to celebrate this uh, idea that the um, estimated glomerular filtration rate uh, calculation had finally dropped their race category back in July. Um, and that's just a, a calculation that uses a bunch of metrics and race being one of them. And the race category was, are you black or not? Right. And the assumption was that um, black people have higher muscle mass and thus their kidney uh, numbers were higher, um, which can often excluded them from the transplant lists and things like this. So these these stories, we, we assume in science that these these calculations and these things are objective and are, are as a result of a scientific process that must be founded in truth and and you know objective truth whatever that means um and so this has gone unaddressed for years and years and years and now and it's had this profound negative impact on um certain people so so i think that, that's just one example though of, of of race um the stories we tell ourselves about race and how uh they can influence real life and and kind of um neglect or not be integrated storytelling not being integrated into the scientific process as you said so and then in the anatomy lab we could say the same it you know there's a, the cliche of oh we're all the same underneath the skin once you peel, peel the skin we're all the same but we know there, there's variation uh from the norm there's there's all sorts of things we like to categorize normal variations of anatomy all the time and and you know in my experience and i'm sure in the other anatomist experience it's more often the variation than the norm a lot of the time so um i'm not sure that that fully answers your question i don't know if i could for i'm pre prepared to fully answer your question but i think embracing the gray and that sort of amb ambiguous ambiguosity ambiguousness of, of ambiguity science. <laughs> ambiguity thank you of science is it was something that will further science and uh and make it more inclusive and more usable i just want to uh, just pick up on on your question claudia because i think it's really really um fundamental because and it's fundamental to so many things in terms of what we're talking about with race, but also what we're going to face more and more around the climate emergency. Um, because what you've said about this, this tradition of division and categorizing and isolating from categorization is a very European um, way of, of uh, you know, it's, it's a cosmology, it's a, it's a metaphysics. Um, and as opposed to a kind of, um, as opposed to indigenous cosmology, there are two, you know, creation stories between um, a kind of European Adam and Eve story banished, you know, banished to um, from the garden. Um, and the, 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 there's a, there's a, I'm not going to get this right, but there's a, um, there's a sky woman um, creation in indigenous um, mythology, and they are completely different because one, one is in which there's separation from this sort of cosmic, the spiritual world. And the other is when it's is turtle, you know, or Turtle Island, for example, when, when it's just all connected. And, and that kind of um, mentality permeates everything that we come to, we come to think of as European thought or white supremacy in, in, in many ways. But, you know, in, in Cree culture, for example, um, a tree is a who and not a what. And so it's that kind of division that is not only perpetuates the division amongst us ourselves, but us and nature, and that is going to and is happening as a as a you know way that is going to lead to ex possible extinction. So you know I think it's a really important point that you make that it's um that our whole way of constructing what we call science is um, possibly a damaging method. So our way of constructing science 
preventing us from feeling a sense of belonging um, and a sense of unity in that way. Mm -hmm. um, when you mentioned the belonging, I went back in my mind to a wonderful talk by Elder Larry Grant of the Musqueam Nation here about belonging and the sense of belonging to the land and belonging to a family and belonging to a community. Um, and, um, and he was so generous in his way of talking about it, as he mentioned that he really empathizes with so many immigrants to Canada who lose their sense of belonging um, and, and what that does to a, to a country and to a community. It was um, a, a very sort of moving um, discussion about this, this belonging from an in indigenous perspective, and then with his generosity, extending it to, uh, to immigrants, to his lands. Yeah, I think the idea of rupture, you know, is something that my whole existence is based on, you know, rupture from ancestors who were transported to um, Guyana. And, and so that kind of perpetual um, rupture doesn't facilitate belonging. Um, and, and I, you know, it's, it's um, that belonging to the land because you lose your connection to the land. And I think it, it's important for us to recognize that, but also to reintegrate into a kind of landscape that, that, that we belong in and Absolutely. just our, our surroundings. Yeah. And in your book, you talk so beautifully about how you carry these ancestors in your body, um, how you see their... Um, their faces in your face, how you see their stories in the story of your body. Um, so that belonging for your own body really comes through, it, even yeah. if there's a disconnection to the land and a forced disconnection from communities, you still carry all of those inside of your body. Yeah, and you talked earlier about, um, you know, an anatomy having to be, um, in, you know, who, who are we not seeing and you know the visualization and you know that you know who who is left out and one of the things about ancestry that in the way that I was able to trace it is that you know you we go down the male line so we go down the the name the, the surname that you know people women lose or have lost over time and so I wanted to make sure that I that those ancestors that I was claiming and naming were in imagine even in imagining them because that's what I had to do I had to imagine them were the women in 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 my life you know so so I was kind of I was hoping to kind of revitalize a memory particularly for for my female ancestors thank you so much Tessa and um I could talk to you for hours uh, and maybe I will still visit London and maybe you will, if, if I do, please, I hope you'll be so gracious to have me for tea or something. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd be thrilled to. We have lots to talk about. So, yes. Um, but trying to kind of bring all our conversations and, and, and wrap things up. I was going to start with you, Sean, to say, do you have a favorite body part as an anatomist and and also in the light of uh, uh, all that we've been discussing do you have a favorite uh, body part i've been dreading this question <laughs> um i've thought about it a lot i honestly as an anatomist i feel like i can't i can't pick a favorite nor a least favorite um because i can find things i love and hate about every <laughs> every structure so um no, I don't. I don't know. I I can't think of one. I tried to think of like what do I hate dissecting? Uh, what do I what do I hate teaching? Or what do I like teaching? What do I like dissecting? I don't know. I think over time, if I if you're gonna force me to pick a thing, I've grown to love head and neck. Um, all the all the parasympathetic pathways in the head and neck, and like infratemporal fossa region uh, from a teaching and embryological standpoint, all that kind of stuff. So I think uh, I think something in there maybe. Well, I don't know. <laughs> but I, Fabulous. I you get high that. marks from anatomists for giving a shout out to the infratemporal fossa and corda tympani. Yeah. Like that's yeah. that's pretty highbrow. I like it. Tessa. It's fun. Yeah, it is. Tessa, how about you? What's what's well, your favorite was, body part? I was preparing for this too. And <laughs> I think that um it's interesting that that Sean has just said head and neck because I think for me, my favorite um body part of my own is are, are my ears um in other words i think that they're important 
um, not them physically, but their function. In other words, for me, it's I, I, I experience the world orally in such a profound way that I would be quite devastated if I were were to lose, you know, that function. And so, I love how the I love music. I love how the world comes to me orally more than visually. I think so. Um, so I think I'll have to say that. And you want my 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 least favorite. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. I did my research. <laughs> I did my research, and I can say that the erector pili muscle is my least favorite, <laughs> only because I I I think I've I've learned that it's un, un, you know evolutionary evolutionarily unnecessary that we don't need to have goosebumps anymore, and I don't like goosebumps. I don't like being cold or I don't like being whatever else they they come from, maybe embarrassed or or um, whatever that is, that reaction is. So that's what I think. <laughs> that is so fascinating. And uh, when you think about it, it's, it's true. As, as, as someone who um, migrated to Canada from Africa, that was one of the things I discovered very quickly. <laughs> goosebumps. <laughs> goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I always felt cold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so my goosebumps are something I I live with all the time. But, uh, <laughs> that's maybe I, you're right. That's that's one of the least favorite things that happens to me here. <laughs> um, but besides so the cold for goosebumps, they I've often been moved to goosebumps, and it's been very transformative moments, very touching moments. So I do give a, a shout out to the small erector pili muscle for um, making me feel and embody a sense of awe. There we oh, go. Oh, I think you've just kind of changed my mind for me, actually. <laughs> That's really true. And one of my, my mother, who's um, 89 this month, when we know that she's feeling something good, she goes, oh, I've got goosebumps. And so you're right. So I'm gonna to have to maybe make it my one of my more favorite ones. But... And this is why I can't pick one. Cause there's yeah, no, it is, all. yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. So maybe you are asking, all the weeds on it. <laughs> <laughs> are asking a favorite and least favorite is again, us categorizing. So maybe we're learning this exactly. isn't a good idea. All right. <laughs> Binary thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well, I'd like to read your, it's actually your um, opening page where you quote this passage, uh, Tessa, from James Baldwin, something he, he wrote, where, where, you said, where he said, you think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the, in the history of the world, but then you read, you know, um, that's so profound to me, that's so profound to me how you know, reading, learning about other cultures, learning about other people, finding about others' stories, you know, helps you situate your own, where you then, they actually validate some, your own stories, but at the same time, open your eyes to things that you've never seen or thought about before. And, and I, I felt, um, I really, so much of your book, every single part of your book is really, for me, um, I've, I've really enjoyed uh, reading it, and and uh, again, thank you so much for 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 writing it and for sharing it with the world, um, Tessa. Oh, thank you so much, Shagan. That is, uh, those are wonderful things to hear, and I really, really appreciate it. And it's been such a pleasure to talk to you both, and to show, and to you, Sean. Thank you both for joining us. Um, what a what a wonderful conversation. We'll put a link to the book into the description of the podcast so everybody can get their hands on it. I highly recommend we all read it to understand better what our bodies mean and what embodying a racialized body means. Thank you, Tessa. Thank you, Sean. Um, I look forward to future conversations. All the best to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much.